Uh, we will now pause in our lecture for any questions that the participants might have. So welcome to, uh, to question time. So uh, here's the question. Uh, in Buddhism, uh, there is no such um, notion or term as soul. So then what is reborn and what goes from one state into another? So what, what is it? Uh, you, you will remember from our discussion the other day that uh, there are these different, these different strands that are like, a, a, like the um, th threads in a rope that are all woven together, which form the person. Let me just refresh your mind on what the strands are. You won't remember them later, but remember, uh, but uh, what, what are these strands? First is matter. That's your flesh and blood, matter. Next is sensation, feelings. The next is perception, what you see, what you perceive. Then is mental impulses, the functions of the mind, and consciousness. I'm alive, I'm conscious. Those five strands comprise you. They are impermanent, always changing, but always there. And those strands hold you together because you desire to be together. You want those strands to be together. That's why you get born and reborn and born and reborn because your tana, your wrong tana, holds those strands together. When you acquire arahat, then you have lost the rubber band, as it were, that holds all those strands together. It snaps and the strands dissipate. And so you become absorbed into the universal nirvana. But that universal nirvana uh, is no more comprises all those five strands holding together. It snaps open and you cease to be born and reborn anymore. You are absorbed into the universal sea like a drop of water is absorbed into the ocean wave. The drop is in the wave, but it's no more a drop. It has now become absorbed into the universal. That's the Buddhist, that's the Buddhist understanding. Um, so uh, within the Christian faith, uh, we talk about the bodily resurrection of the whole person. So that in the resurrection, um, I won't be absorbed into the universal within Christian faith. No, I will continue to live on in the next life as David Schenk. I'll be me and you'll be you. It's the total person who rises from the dead, not just a soul in the Christian faith. The soul is part of our personhood, but, it's, but it is the soul, it's the total person that rises from the dead within the Christian faith and, uh, and continues to live eternally uh, with God in a fellowship relationship in heaven. That's a vastly different understanding than the understanding of Buddhism. We'll now go to another question, a very excellent question. I'm glad you raised that because I'm sure many hearing this lecture will have a similar, similar kinds of questions. I wanted to ask, uh, why do we call Buddhism a religion if, there is, if the Buddhists believe uh, that there is no God? All right. When we began this course, we talked a little bit about our definition of religion. And in that definition, we recognized that some religions particularly Buddhism, but Confucian, Confucianism as an ideology also, uh, do not believe in a creator God. Um, and yet they um, function as, as uh, religiously, you might say, in the sense that they have some awareness, uh, some recognition of what we call the mysterium. Uh, the mysterium is a broader term than God but it is a recognition that there are people who might not believe in, a, in God and certainly don't believe in a personal creator God of the Christian faith. There are people like that, but who nevertheless are religiously oriented. Um, 
Maybe they worship spirits, for example, but they don't worship a creator God. Well, they're, they're very religious people. They worship spirits, you see. And some don't worship spirits or divinities like Buddhism, like Buddha, but nevertheless has an awareness of, of, um, of um, a mysterium, a, a dimension to life which is uh, beyond uh, expression, I guess you would say. And so we've made our description of religion quite broad to include that phenomenon among us of people who don't believe in God, but uh, who nevertheless uh, have a, a uh, yearning for a connection with, with the mysterium. I think I mentioned uh, in the class earlier on about how years ago when I was visiting uh, Yugoslavia back in 1979, they told me that the government is now approving building atheistic chapels in the cemeteries. Well, what's that about? It's a recognition that in death there is a mysterium. What actually happens to the person after you die? And so they were building these uh, little chapels for people to go and think about all of that uh, in these atheistic chapels, yes. Good question. Uh, can we practice Buddhism if, if we are Christians? Because all right, very good question. Um, or you could say, can you uh, be a Christian and practice Hindu yoga? You know, that's, that's a question which a lot of Christians ask. Um, if you would talk to a Hindu about yoga, he would say, yes, of course, you can practice yoga and be a Christian. In fact, you can worship any god you want to uh, and still be a, and still be a, be a Hindu. Would be, would be the Hindu answer to that. Within Buddhism, Buddha says he doesn't believe in a god, but if you want to worship a god, that's fine. So the Buddhist answer to that question would be, yes, of course you can. Uh, you, can, you, can you can follow Buddhist philosophy and be a Christian. Uh, Buddha said, if you want to pray to any god, go ahead, do so. I just don't believe that, that there's a god there to help you, but if you want to, that's up to you. So Buddhism gives you that kind of freedom. But when you look at the essence of Christian faith, then I would need to say no, uh, because the worldview of Buddhism uh, is, is dramatically different than the worldview of the Christian faith, where, where we believe that there is a personal righteous creator God who has created us and that we are accountable to this God uh, who has created us and sustains the universe. And, uh, and when we are committed to him, then we cannot submit to other divinities uh, or philosophies that take us in directions different than what Jesus would take us. And so I think a Christian response would be, there's some values in Buddhist philosophy or some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, exercises of yoga might have some psychological value, but be very careful about that because uh, um, uh, those practices develop within a worldview, which, uh, which is not the Christian worldview. Uh, God, the creator of heaven and earth, and we're accountable to him, created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the Christian center. And uh, philosophies that lead us away from that center, uh, Christians uh, find it necessary to say, I, I, won't, go, I won't go in that direction. Very good. Excellent questions. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Some years ago, I was in Thailand. Several times I've been to Thailand. And I was uh, in a bus going into Bangkok. And all at once, our uh, tour guide in the bus stood up and she said over the microphone in the bus, look, there it is, there it is. And we looked out the window and there we saw a muddy water hole. And the muddy water hole was covered with lotus flowers in full beautiful bloom, these lotus uh, flowers in that mud hole. And then she went on to say, that's what Buddhism is about. Now what did she mean? The lotus flower is a symbol of Buddhism, a symbol that in Buddhist philosophy, a person is encouraged 
to transcend his circumstance. That lotus flower is so beautiful. What is the circumstance in which the lotus flower grows? It's a mud hole, a muddy mud hole. That's, that's the circumstance. But out of that circumstance comes forth this beautiful flower that is so lovely, transcending the circumstance of the mud hole. And Buddhism says that's what Buddhist philosophy is about, equipping you to transcend whatever your mud hole might be. Maybe you're having a very difficult circumstance, illness or trouble in the family or lost your job. The circumstance is terrible. Buddhist philosophy seeks to help you understand how to transcend that circumstance so that you might experience inner peace within that circumstance. That's, that's the philosophy of Buddhism. And it's a very individualistic philosophy. Each person is on his own, attempting to find his own path. Um, but Buddhist philosophy, Buddhists say, gives some help on how to find your path forward within your circumstance. Several years ago, I was with uh, a group of Buddhist, Hindus, uh, Muslims, so forth, uh, religious leaders of different religions, and we were talking, each group was talking about the way in which their particular religion contributes to peacemaking. And when the two Buddhist nuns who were in that gathering spoke, this happened in Nepal, where we were having this conversation, when the Buddhist nuns spoke, they said, our commitment to peacemaking is to have inner peace. And Buddhist philosophy equips us to have inner peace. And we do not take responsibility, therefore, for society and what is happening in society and so forth. Rather, we seek to retreat and to go into the sanghas and to meditate and reflect there in the sangha that we might experience personal inner peace. That's our contribution to peacemaking, not working with the society as a whole. The lotus flower, transcending the circumstance um, that beauty may burst forth. That's the philosophy of Buddhism as it thinks about peacemaking in the world in which uh, the Buddhists live and survive.